pray with me? Father, we are truly grateful for your amazing grace and unending love, that you have shown that to us time and time again. When we fall short, when we rebel, your grace comes evermore. Help us now in this time, Lord, as we open your word to be encouraged by it, to be shaped by it, to understand what it means so that we may live in light of it, and that through the preaching of your word and the obedience to your word that we seek to have, that you would be glorified and that those around us would be one with the gospel, the gospel that we have, the gospel that we seek to proclaim, and the gospel that we seek to live in light of. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we're going to be in 19 to 23 this morning. And as you're turning there, I wonder, how often do you think about animals? Just curious, do you think, man, those are some cool animals ever? Does that ever come across your mind? You see it on TV. Well, one of the coolest animal groups on the planet, in my opinion, so take it with a grain of salt, are amphibians. Amphibians, things like frogs and salamanders and newts and axolotls, those, those slimy, creepy, crawly things that most of us probably don't want to touch. Uh, but they are one of the coolest groups of animals on the planet. And what makes them so cool is that unlike most other animals, amphibians can live both in and out of water. They can live in the water, they can live outside of the water. And, and there's no real struggle for them in either area of, of that life. Many adult amphibians can spend four to seven hours underwater at a time, and it's due to their ability to absorb oxygen through their skin. You didn't know you were getting a, a biology lesson today or a, a zoology or whatever you want to call it lesson, but you are. This means that amphibians are as much at home in the water as they are outside the water. And this is a trait I think we can strive for a little more as Christians today. And I'm not saying you got to go start holding your breath underwater for four to seven hours, but just being able to be adaptable to your environment and the situation you're in. We need to become gospel amphibians with the ability to adapt to different environments. Excellent at this. He was certainly a gospel amphibian. And you didn't think when you got here today that I would call Paul a frog, but I did. So we'll just move on from there. He was able to adapt whenever necessary for the sake of the gospel and those he was surrounded by. If he needed to act as if he was, as we'll see this morning, a a Jew, which he was, but living as a Jew, he could do it. If he needed to adapt and live as if he was a Gentile among Gentiles, he would do it. And he was fine with either way he went. He was adaptable. He was a gospel amphibian, and he did it for the purpose of winning people to Christ. That was his goal. That was his aim. Is he didn't just want to fit in with the crowd he was in. He wanted them to not have any reason to stumble or reject the gospel when he preached it to them. He wanted to win souls in whatever means necessary. So read with me. We'll see, God, uh, see Paul as a gospel amphibian in verses 19 to 23. He says this, Although I am free from all and not anyone's slave, I have made myself a slave to everyone in order to win more people. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, to win those under the law. To those who are without the law, like one without the law, though I am not without God's law, but under the law of Christ, to win those without the law. To the weak, I became weak in order to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that, I might, so that I may by every possible means save some. Now I do all this because of the gospel, so that I may share in the blessings. 
So there's three points I want to make this morning, and they kind of connect to one another. The first one is that we are free. We'll see this in verse 19. Paul himself says, he begins this section by asserting again the same reality that we've seen him bring up before in verse 1 of chapter 9. He states he is free from all and not a slave to anyone. What this means is that he is free from the burden of the law. Paul understood that Christ fulfilled the requirements of the law for him and for those who believe in him. That burden is not his anymore. He doesn't have to wake up every day and think, oh man, I've got to do all of these, these things that the law has prescribed in order to be right with God, in order to earn salvation. He doesn't have to do that anymore. He's free from that burden. He knows that when he wakes up, mercy is new every day, that he has the grace of Christ that covers him and washed away all of his sins, and that Christ is his righteousness. He is free. He's not bound to the law anymore. He's not, uh, it's not a burden over him anymore. But he also says he's free from being a slave to men. Paul knows that he has one master. He belongs to Christ and Christ alone. He's free from being a slave to others. He, he doesn't have to worry about their opinions and expectations of him because they are not authoritative. Paul knew it does not matter what these Jews think of me. It doesn't matter what these Gentiles think of me, what they want me to do. I don't have to listen to them. I don't have to obey their conditions and commands because I have Christ. He's who I obey. He's who I follow. He's the one whose opinion I care about. He's required, he knew this, he understood this, that he is required to answer to and bend his knee to one, and it is Christ. That is all. And so he starts out with that truth and that reality, that he is free. There is no need for him to submit again to the law. There is no need for him to submit to the desires and expectations of those around him. He doesn't have to. And the same is true for us. I hope you believe that this morning, that the same is true for us, that we are free from all and not a slave to anyone. Paul says this in Romans 7, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you also were put to death in relation to the law, through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another. You belong to him who was raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions aroused through the law were working in us to bear fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law since we have died to what held us so that we may serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the old letter of the law. We have been released from the burden of the law. We have been released from it because Christ fulfilled it. He fulfilled it for us. He died for us. And in his death, we have died to the law as well. We belong to him. He is our master. He is the one that we get to serve. We get to serve in the newness of the Spirit, not the old letter of the law. We are free in Christ. How many of you get the feeling, though, when someone is telling you something really good and awesome like that, that you don't have to follow the law anymore? You're free in Christ. He's released you from that burden. How many of you get the feeling when someone tells you really good news like that, that there is a but coming? Is anyone getting that feeling right now? I hope so. You should be. Here is the but. Galatians 5.13. For you were called to be free. Good news, right? Only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. So we are free. Like Paul, we are free from the burden of the law. We are free from being a slave to anyone for their expectations or their opinions. We have one master and he is Christ. But 
We are free not for ourselves only. We are free to be enslaved. This is where Paul moves to next in our text. He says, although I am free, not anyone's slave, I have made myself a slave to everyone in order to win more people to Christ. That's the second point we see this morning. We are free to be enslaved. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Verses 19 to 22, we see this. And one commentator, Warren Wearsby, says, What a paradox. Free from all men and yet the servant of all men. That was Paul, and that is what we ought to be as well. We are free from all, yet we are the servant of all. This was the life and mentality of Paul, that of a gospel amphibian. When among the Jews, he lived as a Jew. When among those under the law, like one under the law. When among those without the law, he lived like one without the law. When he was among the weak, he says, he lived like the weak. First, to the Jews and those under the law, we see this. We get two different groups here that we could look at individually. We could look at the Jews and then those under the law because there was this reality that some Gentiles submitted to the law and that's who that second category is. But we're going to take them both together because they, they line up in so many ways it, it would be helpful for us to think of them together. Here we see he adapted to living as a Jew and as one under the law, but he did so without compromising on the truth. He made it clear that he himself was not under the law. Look what he says. To the Jews I became like a Jew, to win Jews. To those under the law, like one under the law. Though I myself am not under the law. So don't miss that. He's saying, when I was around those who the law had a hold of, who they still followed to some degree, I became like them. But I myself am not bound by the law anymore. Even though he, he would live as if he was still following the law around those who followed the law, he himself was not bound to it. So let's be clear. What Paul did not do in living as a Jew or as one under the law. He did not return to honoring the sacrificial system Christ fulfilled. So he did not subscribe to, okay, we've got to bring these guilt offerings and these sin offerings. He didn't do that. Because he knows that Christ fulfilled that. This is Rome. Again, this comes from Paul. Romans 6, verse 10. For the death he died that is Christ, he died to sin once for all time. He, he paid the price. There is no need for them to bring those sin or guilt offerings anymore. And so when Paul says, I lived as one, as one under the law, he's not living this way. He's not bringing that offering, that sacrificial system anymore. He also did not advocate a works salvation theology. He did not go around saying, well, you have to follow the law in order to be saved. He didn't preach that. He didn't proclaim that. He didn't follow that. And so when he says, I lived as one under the law, he did not live as if he had to follow the law in order to be saved. This is, again, Paul, from his mouth, Ephesians 2, you are saved by grace through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God, not from works, so that no one can boast. So that's, he did not do that. He did not go back to the sacrificial system. He did not advocate a work salvation theology. So then what did he do? What would Paul have done as one living under the law? We have several examples from the book of Acts we can look at. This is the first one. He had Timothy, who was half Jewish, half Greek, circumcised for the sake of the Jews they went to preach to. This is Acts 16. It says, Paul went on to Derbe and Lystra, where there was a disciple named Timothy, the son of a believing Jewish woman, but his father was a Greek. The brothers and sisters at Lystra and Iconium spoke highly of him. 
Paul wanted Timothy to go with him, so he took him and circumcised him. Why? Because the law said so? No. Because of the Jews who were in those places, since they all knew that his father was a Greek. So he did this. He lived as if he was under the law. He made those who traveled with him live as if they were under the law when they went to those who were under the law. So there be no stumbling block. So that when they went and they preached the gospel in those places, having known that Timothy was half Jewish and half Greek, they would see, okay, he's okay with our customs, with our, our regulations that we followed. And so they were more willing to listen to him. And we, we know that Paul is not saying that Timothy had to be circumcised in order to be right with God. Over and over, he advocates against that. He would say, circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. So rather, it was because of the Jews that this happened. He lived as if he was under the law, among those who were under the law. We see him later on in Acts in chapter 18, likely take a Nazarite vow. So again, he lived as if he was under the law, even though he was not bound by the law. It says he shaved his head at Centria because of a vow he had taken. So there were times where he would still do things that the law talked about and prescribed, but he understood they are not binding for him anymore. The last one we'll look at is Acts 21, verses 20 to 25. This is, again, an instance where it's very clear that he's only doing this for the sake of the Jews and those who are under the law around him. If it were up to him, he would not see any need for this, but he does it for their sake. It says this, when they heard it, they glorified God and said, you see, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are who have believed. And they are all zealous for the law, but they have been informed about you that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to abandon Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or to live according to our customs. So what is to be done? All right, before we continue on, we need to understand what's happening. There were these Jews that became believers, but... They had this wrong understanding that Paul was going around saying, you don't need Moses anymore, forget about the law, you don't need to circumcise anyone anymore, you don't need to follow the customs anymore. They were, there was this group that was getting a little disgruntled towards Paul. They were misunderstanding what he was actually doing and teaching. And so there's this problem, and this is the solution that was that was brought before him as to what he could do for their sake. So what is to be done, it says. They will certainly hear that you've come. Therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who have made a vow. Take these men, purify yourself along with them, and pay for them to get their heads shaved. Then everyone will know that what they were told about you amounts to nothing but that you yourself are also careful about observing the law. With regard to the Gentiles who have believed, we've written a letter containing our decision that they should keep themselves from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from what is strangled, and from sexual immorality. So again, this problem of the Jews were thinking Paul had abandoned the law, that, that he was teaching you don't need it anymore, that it's worthless, that you don't need to follow the customs. That's what they were hearing. And so to dissuade those fears, he follows the law. He goes and he purifies himself according to the customs of the law. He pays for the other four men that needed to do this because they were taking a vow to have their heads shaved. He's a team player, in other words. He's okay with them doing those things. He himself will do these things according to the law. He did it for their sake as one under the law, even though he's not under the law. The next group is to those without the law. In other words, Gentiles, those whom the law was not given to, who did not follow the law. Paul adapted when he was around them. Again, however, we need to be clear on what Paul did and did not do. So look at, look at where he talks about this in verse uh, 21. Verse 21. 
It says, to those, without, to those who are without the law, like one without the law. Though I am not without God's law, but under the law of Christ. So again, just like he did with the Jews and those under the law, he qualifies it that I'm not under the law. But now, to those without the law, he's saying, I'm not forsaking God's law. I'm not without God's law. Instead, it's a different and new understanding in light of Christ and how he approaches the law of God. What Paul did was live under the law of Christ. So when he was among these Gentiles, he's not forsaking the, the word of God in the Old Testament, the law of Moses. He's not forsaking that, saying it's useless and worthless. But he's understanding it in a new light because of Christ. He still sees the law as important. But it's not what saves. It's Christ. So he's under the law of Christ, which is characterized by viewing the moral law of God revealed in the Old Testament as good and not irrelevant. So as a popular preacher in the last several years had said, we need to unhitch from the Old Testament, Paul would not have been on that bandwagon. Paul would have not said, we don't need the Old Testament anymore because Christ has come. No, he would have said, we look at the Old Testament still. We learn from the Old Testament. We learn from the law of God, the character of God, the purposes of God, the promises of God that are fulfilled and seen rightly in Christ. So he's not discarding the law, but he is living in a new understanding of the law. He's under the law of Christ. The law of Christ is exemplified and characterized most by love. This is Galatians 5. Again, this is Paul. For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement, love your neighbor as yourself. He's living under the law of Christ, understanding the moral law of the Old Testament, saying that is good and right and should be followed. But we understand it in Christ and that the main reality that we need to understand is loving our neighbors as ourselves. One could think of it in this way. Believers live under Christ's law when they live for the good of others, especially when they are concerned about bringing others to salvation. So to live under the law of Christ is to look for the good of others, which the good of others means following the moral law of God, what is right and what is wrong, and bringing them to Christ. That's what it looks like to live under the law of Christ. That's the main concern, to do what is right, not what is wrong, to bring others to Christ so that they may be saved. That's certainly what Paul did, and he did that when he was around these Gentiles, those without the law. He did not seek to make them submit to the regulations and practices of the law. He didn't require them to observe the festivals and holidays of the Jewish people. He didn't require them to be circumcised. Again, he preached against that for Gentiles. Instead, he called them to believe in Christ and live lives that lined up with that reality of believing in Christ. So that's what he did among the Gentiles, among the Jews and those under the law, as if he was under the law, even though he wasn't. To the Gentiles, those without the law, as if he was without the law, though he wasn't. He had the law of Christ. Now, the last one, to the weak, he became weak. Paul was anything but weak, though, right? We understand that. Paul would never be characterized as weak in the faith. But for the sake of the weak, he sought to live among them as though he was. We have the perfect example in chapter 8 meat sacrificed to idols verse 13 of chapter 8 Paul was ready and willing he says to never again eat meat if that's what it took to make sure the weak didn't fall to make sure they didn't stumble never again eat meat and he would do this even though he knows the truth that idols are nothing and that food doesn't bring you closer to God but he'd do it for the weak. He would forsake the meat. He'd forsake eating that 
forever for the good of the weak among him. So it's clear, Paul was a, a gospel amphibian. And the last phrase he says here in this, he became all things to all people. That's how Paul ends his breakdown of how he has sought to become a slave to everyone. All things to all people. Whatever the situation called for, as long as it did not require sin or failing to follow the law of Christ, Paul was going to do it. Didn't matter what it was. If it wasn't sinful and it didn't cause him to not follow the law of Christ marked by love, he was going to do it. We saw this earlier in chapter 9. He refused his right to compensation for their sake and so that the gospel would not be hindered. He had every right to be paid for his work in the gospel and his work among them, but he said, for your sake, I didn't make use of any of it because he sought to be all things to all people. Whatever the situation called for, he would do it. Paul's greatest desire was to bring glory to Christ. And he did that through his pursuit of saving as many people as he possibly could at all costs. Church, like Paul, we ought to be willing to become everyone's slaves in order to win some to Christ. Whatever the cost. If it's not sin, if it's not unloving, we ought to be willing to do it for the sake of winning them to Christ because that is salvation. When he says winning them to Christ, he means that they are saved, that they are redeemed from the kingdom of darkness and death, brought into the kingdom of the Son. So we ought to be willing to become slaves to everyone for that purpose. We need to become true gospel amphibians, willing to live differently, even uncomfortably at times, so as to not cause someone to stumble and refuse the gospel message. We need to understand that our preferences and rights are less important than someone hearing and responding to the gospel with faith. Our preferences don't matter in comparison to that at all it's night and day different so maybe that looks like giving up your right this is a, a pretty dramatic one but it's one that many have to do giving up your right to live here in the united states that's a that's a right that you have you can live here for as long as you'd like you are free to do that but some may be called to give up that right and train and prepare and go and live amidst an unreached people group in a country that looks vastly different than ours for the sake of those there hearing the gospel. It would involve a lot of preparation, giving up a lot of time. It would involve learning their language it would involve learning and living in line with their traditions and their customs. For instance, if I went to certain Asian countries, I would have to adapt to their custom of removing their shoes from before entering their house, something I hate to do. I always want shoes on my feet. I don't know if it's because I got ugly feet But that's something that I have a preference of that I would have to give up because if I didn't, if I entered their house with shoes on and maybe some of your houses too, if I entered in with shoes on, that's automatically going to put up a wall that I've got to now get over so that they'll listen to the gospel. It might look like older generations seeking to understand the younger generations that we do things differently, and it's not bad. And the other way, younger generations seeking to understand the older generations, that we do things differently, and it's not bad. It's okay that we're different. That's part of the beauty of the gospel, bringing us together. 
might look like not driving a big lifted diesel truck to the home of an environmental activist. (laughs) If you want someone to never listen to what you have to say, that would be one way to do it. Someone who cares about the planet and you driving up rolling coal out the side of your truck in their driveway. They're not going to listen to you. You might need to drive that Prius to their house. It might look like not ordering the 32-ounce porterhouse steak while at dinner with a vegetarian. All it takes is living under the law of Christ, having compassion, having love for one another, caring about what the other person cares about at least while you're with them. It might look like speaking in a way that the person you're talking to can understand. For instance, if you're talking to a child, don't talk to them as if they were an astrophysicist because they're not going to have any idea what you're saying. And the other way, if you're talking to an astrophysicist, don't speak to them like they're a child. They're not going to like that. They've got a PhD. Talk to them like a grown-up. And the list could go on and on, but the point and the goal remains the same. You adapt as necessary for the sake of winning as many people as you can to Christ. Whether you're in water or out of water, be an amphibian, you can go either way. You can eat a salad for dinner instead of a a steak tonight. You can drive, you can rent a car and drive that Prius to their house instead of your big lifted truck. Whatever it takes, Paul would do whatever it takes. We can do the same. And as we become all things to all people, we get to remember the blessings of the gospel that we share in as well. This is how Paul ends in verse 23. We are free to be enslaved because of the gospel. Paul ends this short section with the with telling his motivation for becoming all things to all people. It's because of the gospel. That's why he does it. He's free, but he seeks to be a slave to everyone. Why? Because of the gospel. Because Paul received the gospel, he believed the gospel, was convinced of the power of the gospel, and so he sought to live for the advancement of the gospel, no matter the personal cost. Because the blessings he had received and would one day receive in full in the gospel were far greater than any momentary struggle he may have or lack of his preference being met or his rights being met. Paul knows and he reveals to us that part of the blessing of the gospel is to be a part of the task all believers have of calling people to Christ and winning souls. We don't talk like that very much anymore, of winning souls. But that's what Paul did. That's what he's talking about here. He's winning souls to Christ at whatever means necessary. That was part of the blessing of the gospel, that the gospel he was saved by, that the Jesus he loves and he knows that came to live a sinless life to die on the cross for him and his sins, he got to respond to that good news and that grace and that mercy with sharing it with others. That was a blessing for Paul. It was inconceivable to him that someone could be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and fail to live for the Lamb and fail to go forward with the gospel. It was inconceivable. That would have been nonsense to Paul. So church, if we are truly a group of people brought together by the gospel, who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, the Son of God, then everything we do ought to be for the sake of the gospel and the chance to share in its blessings to share in the blessing of sharing it, to share in the blessing of the salvation it brings. 
Part of the proof of our salvation is seen in our willingness to live for the sake of Christ and his gospel. If you're not willing to live for Christ, if you're not willing to live for the sake of the gospel going forward, then I have to question, is it because you don't know the gospel? Is it because you don't know Jesus? Because if you know Jesus and you know the gospel and the power of the gospel that saves, then your life ought to reflect that. We can all give up some of our rights and freedoms for the sake of winning those around us to Christ. They're not worth it. The soul of that other person is worth more than our rights and our preferences and our freedoms. Yes, we are free. And we are a slave to no one but Christ. But we ought to use that freedom to become a slave to everyone because of the gospel. The gospel that is the power of God for salvation to those who believe. And how will they believe unless we go and take it to them? If you're here this morning and you don't know that power, you don't know the power of the gospel that saves, I pray that you would today, that you would hear of this Jesus that causes someone to give up any right they have to put their life on the line as Paul did, to be beaten and shipwrecked over and over for the sake of the gospel. That you would hear that and see Jesus as worth giving up your rights and your life to because Jesus gave up his life for you. He had every right to life. He had every right to come down off that cross, but he said, no, I'm staying because I love them. They don't know what they're doing, but I'm dying for them. He did that for you. Believe in him and experience the power of the gospel. Experience salvation. Would you pray with me? God, we are grateful for your gospel, your truth, the good news that you came to redeem a people for yourself and that you did so through your life, death, and resurrection. We thank you that it was more than able to wash away our sins, that your blood was able to cleanse us and make us white as snow. Help us, Lord, in our freedom, choose willingly, joyfully to become a slave and a servant to everyone for the sake of winning them to you as we have been won to you. God, help us to see that endeavor as joining in and experiencing the full blessing of the gospel that we have believed. God, if there's someone here this morning who does not know you, who's never experienced your gospel and the blessing it is to receive it, I pray that they would today. That they would confess you as Lord and Savior, that they would believe in their heart that you were raised from the dead on the third day to defeat sin and death forever. And I pray that we would be able to rejoice with them celebrate the new life they now have. But God, no matter what, we are grateful that we get to become servants of others because you came as the ultimate servant to give your life as a ransom for many. Help us to follow in your footsteps, the footsteps that Paul followed in. Help us to be like you, Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen. If you're here this morning and you need